Immortality. Now when I say immortality, there are no doubt many of you in the audience who would roll your eyes at the idea. I mean on the outside the notion seems absurd. After all, there are only two constants in this world, death and taxes. But is there any real legitimacy to the notion? And more importantly, is immortality actually possible? This is something that I find near and dear to my heart, for reasons I will go into exhaustive lengths about. I wanted to create this video and discuss my opinions on the matter, and to hopefully spread the idea of a concept that is steadily gaining more mainstream attention. Over the next couple of hours, I will be referencing a great deal of scientific literature. I will provide links to all of these in the description, so please feel free to read these at your leisure. Now genuinely from the bottom of my heart, thank you for clicking on this video, and not being scared at the sheer daunting size of it. I've broken it down into parts, with timestamps that can be found in the description below. You are more than welcome to watch the whole thing in one go like one big documentary if you are an absolute mad lad. Alternatively, treat it like a pizza. Enjoy one slice at a time. Regardless, whether you're watching this video out of genuine interest, because you're procrastinating and putting off that thing you really should be doing, or listening to me like a podcast, I would like to invite you to stay a while and listen. Since time immemorial, humans have feared the Reaper. It is a concept that all of us have to come to terms with at one point or another. Our time on this earth is brief. One day you, I, and everyone you know and love will be dead. It's a horrible and bleak reality. The idea that one day everything that makes you, you, will be gone. And it won't be like going to sleep, because even in our nocturnal haven, we still dream, still think. Death is the absence of anything, not even an endless void because that abyss implies the existence of something. There is simply nothing. This is the atheist belief. All we have is our time here on earth. As an atheist myself, I understand why so many reject this. My father's side were devout Catholics. Rarely could I visit my grandmother and not see her listening to the mass channel watching these strange men in cloaks and robes recite words from a book said to be hundreds of years old. There is a comfort in that. If ideas can stand the test of time, then there is at least some hope that something can live on after us. It was what made me initially want to become a novelist as a child. I could read books from men and women who perished hundreds of years ago. In that small way, there is proof that once upon a time, they existed, and that they mattered. We see this at play throughout history, people realising that the only true path to maintaining some essence of themselves is to perform deeds that live on well past their lifetimes. Now as an atheist, I do not believe he was the son of God, but I do believe there is a lot of evidence to suggest that he did exist, and that he did spread his teachings. Jesus Christ was said to have died April 3rd, 33 AD. That is almost 2,000 years ago, yet there are few alive today, especially in the English-speaking world, who do not know his name. Sun Tzu lived hundreds of years before even he, and yet everyone from businessmen, sports athletes, and even League of Legends commentators have invoked this man's words of wisdom. In a way, one can argue that these figures have become immortal. The ancient Egyptians, a civilization that have become somewhat synonymous with death and the afterlife, used to believe that everyone suffered two deaths. The first, when you take your final breath. The second, the last time anyone utters your name. I love this line from Coco. When there is no one left in the living world who remembers you, you disappear from this world. We call it the final death. A cynical mind might argue that this is what pushes so many. The fortitude and rigour to be remembered for the intellectual pursuit of a great scientific discovery. The prose to write works that can move one's heart and stimulate one's mind. The emotion and beauty paints on canvas can evoke. The wisdom, 
to help generations to come with ideas that resonate long after their passing. The strength and willpower to conquer lands and build empires. Isaac Newton, William Shakespeare, Marcus Aurelius, Leonardo da Vinci, and Alexander the Great. All of these figures died hundreds of years ago, yet remain household names. For so long as people live and are aware of their deeds, those that create a legacy have found a way to live on. The past is filled with people who try to elevate themselves, those who build pyramids of their tombs, and it seems to be for this exact reason. But as the global population nears 8 billion, the ability for people to stand out from the crowd becomes harder and harder. Now there are no doubt many of you that would argue against my hypothesis. You would likely say that most don't want to be known or remembered. Many would be happy to settle for a humble and peaceful life. But reality doesn't seem to align with that belief. A recent study by the Morning Consult stated that 54% of young Americans wanted to become social media influencers. And this doesn't seem to be for any particular reason, like advancing a scientific discovery or improving humanity in some way. Those people still exist, but the vast majority of men and women who spend their lives trying to make a difference are seldom remembered, not even a footnote in history. So I can't blame people who don't want to do it. As someone in the science industry, I would be hesitant to advise someone to follow in my footsteps. It's a difficult path with very little reward outside the pure passion I have for it. We are far too self-absorbed with projecting a persona of status than with tangible results. And that's not an attack on any one individual who have managed to find the way to elevate themselves, but more a damnation on what our culture has become and the values it holds so dear. Ask a person on the street to name five famous people or even five people they admire, and they will likely not name a humanitarian but a celebrity or online personality. People want to be known for the sake of being known, to be famous for being famous. As the digital age continues to transform modern life, it seems that this is the primary driving force behind what many of us want to do. The hierarchy that social media and an always online society have created does seem to have brought out the inner id in most of us the part of the mind in which innate instinctive impulses are regulated. So what is the meaning of life? I mean, 10 points to everyone who said 42 like the meme lords that you are, but what if you looked at that rather existential question from a biological perspective? All living organisms are built up from their DNA, the blueprints which encode for life. I mean, there is debate about how an RNA world might have existed before, but let's not lose ourselves down that particular rabbit hole just yet. You see, in our DNA, we have what are known as introns, or more commonly referred to today as non-coding DNA. This is a section of our genetic code which has to be spliced out before an RNA molecule is encoded into a protein. There was a time when this was referred to as junk DNA, as it did not appear to serve any function. We now know that this non-coding DNA makes up 98% of our genome. Now we have come a long way since then, and we know that DNA does not have to encode amino acids for it to be useful. Some of this non-coding DNA helps to regulate gene expression, some provide structural support, and other parts are involved in epigenetic regulations. I'll be going into all of this in time, so please don't worry too much for now. But what's important is that we've learned that about 8% of our DNA is the remnants of viruses endogenous retroviruses, or ERVs to be precise. In the past, our common ancestors were infected. Through molecular hijacking, viruses will use a host's own cells to replicate themselves. Now, the goal of most successful viruses, contrary to popular belief, is not actually to kill the host. I know, Ebola clearly didn't get the message. But the reason for this is to do so would kill the virus itself. A virus intends to overtake an organism's cells, to replicate more of itself, to spread onto other organisms, and to keep spreading ad nauseum. Wanting to preserve evidence of our existence is not unique to humans. In our genetic code is the blueprints for ancient viruses, and there doesn't seem to have been any reason why viruses would benefit from this, 
other than for the same reason that writers created works of art, to serve as a reminder to future generations that once upon a time, they had an impact. Yes, the argument can be made that humans have found some uses for some of these ERVs, but at the time of making this video, most do still seem to be useless to us. The desire to create something that can serve as an indication for our presence beyond our mortal lives is quite literally encoded in our DNA. So with that said, I have to ask, is that all there is? Is the meaning for life really that pointless and selfish? Why does nature propagate this system with no end goal? Now I know there is some debate about the theory, but Richard Dawkins at one point might have argued that genes are inherently selfish, and that's not to state that genes have a mind of their own, clearly they're not sentient, but the only purpose of biological evolution seems to be to carry on one's own lineage. We see that in nature. Organisms compete in both intra- and interspecies competition for resources and mating rights to pass on their genetic material. It's why we as humans have such a strong compulsion to reproduce. As we have become more advanced as a civilization, however, is that all there is to it? For many, having a family is their legacy. But when so few of us even know the names of our great grandparents, much less what they did or who they were, is that honestly still good enough? What if the entire purpose of evolution was to get us to the point we are at now, where we can advance and transcend? In order for society to become more advanced and move to the next step, do we need to strive for something greater than simply passing on our genes? Evolution is an imprecise and chaotic process that takes millions of years. Perhaps there was a time when growing old and dying conferred an evolutionary advantage. We see in nature the most successful organisms tend to be microscopic. It's been less than a century since the widespread adoption of antibiotics, and we already have superbugs, bacterium that seem resistant to all forms of antibiotics. The traits that allow a microbe to become resistant requires the utilization of resources, so there was never any need for these to exist before. They would get outcompeted by other organisms that did not specialize for it. But we selected for this world unknowingly. E. coli divide every 20 minutes. If you started with one organism, in 20 minutes you would have two, 40 you would have four, and in an hour you would have eight. In a hypothetical situation where resources and space were not limited, if you started with a single bacterium, after 48 hours, it would grow into a colony bigger than the Earth. It's why they have evolved so rapidly in a mere century. Higher organisms do not have this luxury. We can't exchange information through plasmids horizontally with conjugation tubes. The longer it takes us to reach sexual reproductive age, the less rapidly we can evolve to suit a changing environment. We all know what happened to the dinosaurs. It's why it's so important that the old die, so that they do not continue to pass on their genes, as it would slow down the evolutionary process and stop the species from adapting to the changing times. But that selective advantage is no longer beneficial to humans. We change our environment to suit us, not the other way around. Every time we lose someone to age, we lose so much knowledge, so much experience and wisdom. So let us embrace genetic engineering and help give evolution a helping hand. Let us improve upon what nature has already given us. One theory of aging suggests that genes that conferred a selective advantage in early life may well have detrimental effects the older we live. Those are not normally seen because we've already passed our genes on by the time those detrimental effects take hold. But as our society has become increasingly more complex, we need more time to understand our world. How long does it take to make a great scientist, a great doctor, a great leader, a great anything? Decades. Our lives are so monstrously short that we are already searching for shortcuts in the form of computers and artificial intelligence. So why don't we just go one step further? Why don't we give humans, all of us, more time to reach our potential and no longer be a slave to the genetics that make us up? Let us improve upon ourselves. Let us understand what our own selfish genes are up to because we may then at least have the chance to upset their designs, something that no other species has ever aspired to do.